Assalamu alaikum, I'm Professor Dr. Haider Jawad Mubarak. This is a practical presentation to anatomy of the orbit and the eyeball. The first topic will be about the histology of the bony walls of the orbit and bony margins of the orbit. And this topic had been previously discussed with the uh, presentation of the special region of the skull. And I will cut that part from uh, that presentation and put it there uh, as following. To the cranial cavity. Now we will describe the, another special region, which is the orbit. The orbit is a cavity which is four-sided pyramid. Its base is anterior, which is, which, the, which is formed by the margins of the orbit, and its apex is posterior. Of course, its base is formed by the orbital margins, and we describe that these margins. The upper margin is formed by the orbital plate of a frontal bone. The lateral margin is formed by the zygomatic process of a frontal bone and the frontal process of zygomatic bone. While the lower margin is formed by the zygoma, zygomatic bone, and by the maxilla and the medial border. So uh, it's formed by the uh, maxillary process of frontal bone and the frontal process of maxilla, I repeat. The upper border is formed by the uh, orbital plate of, uh, by the frontal bone, specifically the upper border is formed by the frontal bone, the lateral border by the zygomatic process of a frontal bone and the frontal process of zygomatic, the lower border by zygomatic bone and maxilla and the medial border by the maxilla and the frontal bone. The frontal here show maxillary process and the maxillary bone shows the frontal process. So this is the base of the pyramid. Therefore, it is four-sided pyramid. The roof of the pyramid, the upper, uh, the superior wall, is formed by the orbital plate of frontal bone, anteriorly, and posteriorly by the lesser wing of sphenoid. The lateral wall is formed by the greater wing of sphenoid, posteriorly, and the frontal process of zygomatic bone, anteriorly. And you can see that the, uh, in between the lateral and superior wall, uh, there is uh, a fissure in the posterior part of the junction of the lateral and superior wo uh, wall. This fissure is called the superior orbital fissure that connects the orbit with the middle cranial cavity. The inferior wall is formed by the zygomatic bone and by the maxilla. And there is also a fissure in between the inferior wall and the lateral wall, which is the, called the inferior orbital fissure. This inferior orbital fissure connects the orbit anteriorly with the infratemporal fossae, but it connects the orbit posteriorly with the pterygopalatine fossae. Lastly, the medial wall of the orbit is formed from posterior to anterior by the body of sphenoid, by the uh, orbital plate of ethmoid, lacrimal bone, which is a small bone, and by the frontal process of maxilla. You can see here anteriorly that we have a lacrimal groove. This lacrimal groove is formed partly by the frontal process of maxilla and partly by the lacrimal bone, and this is the suture between the frontal process of maxilla and lacrimal bone. This lacrimal groove continues with the, uh, or contains the lacrimal sac, and inferiorly it is opened to the nasal cavity by the nasolacrimal duct. And that's why when uh, someone is crying, the lacrimal fluid is accumulated in this lacrimal sac and passing through the lacrimal, nasolacrimal duct here inferiorly into the nose. And we can see the anterior and posterior ethmoidal foramen at the suture between the uh, orbital plate of ethmoid and the orbital plate of frontal bone. Posteriorly, the roof is formed by the lesser wing of a sphenoid and the medial wall is formed by the body of sphenoid. And between the lesser wing of sphenoid and the body, this is the optic canal transmitting the optic nerve. Also, the roof shows in the lateral side a depression or a space or a fossa here, which is the lacrimal fossa uh, in the roof laterally. It contains the lacrimal gland. Also, the floor uh, shows here uh, above the infraorbital foramen the floor shows infraorbital groove that leads to the infraorbital foramen. Uh, the lacrimal uh, groove, this is the lacrimal groove. 
is said to be bounded by lacrimal crest. And therefore, the anterior lacrimal crest is uh, a crest in the frontal process of maxilla, while the posterior lacrimal crest is into the lacrimal bone. Of course, this is a very weak region, the cribriform, uh, the orbital plate of ethmoid and the lacrimal bone is very weak region. Sometimes, if someone holds the skull from this region, it will be broken. You can see how the frontal air sinus may extend partly into the orbital plate of frontal bone. That's why sinusitis, uh, inflammation of the sinuses, of the paranasal sinuses, which is specifically frontal sinus, may lead to pain that is referred to the orbit. And uh, this is all about the one point which must be added uh, here that some textbook uh, consider that the most posterior uh, part of the floor of the orbit is formed by the uh, orbital plate of palatine bone. So some textbook reported that the floor is formed by the zygomatic bone maxilla and posteriorly by the orbital plate of uh, palatine bone. Regarding surface anatomy of the eyeball, surface anatomy of the eyeball could be seen when the upper and lower eyelid are open and here we can see in between the upper and lower eyelid the palpebral fissure. Through the palpebral fissure we may see the uh, white tissue of the sclera and uh, we may see the colored iris and uh, we may see uh, the pupil which is the opening inside the color iris and uh, the iris is covered anteriorly by a transparent cornea and uh, here you can see that the junction of the cornea with the sclera is called limbus this region the junction of the cornea and the sclera is called the limbus and uh, <clears throat> also the white sclera is covered with a transparent membrane which is vascular membrane called conjunctiva and this conjunctiva the membrane that covers the sclera is called bulbar conjunctiva uh, you can see in this figure the uh, cornea and you can see that uh, the uh, sclera is covered with the bulbar conjunctiva but also you can see here that the bulbar conjunctiva reflected below and reflected above to line the uh, eyelids and the part of the conjunctiva that lines the eyelid is called uh, palpebral conjunctiva so we have uh, uh, two parts of the conjunctiva which is a vascular a transparent membrane one of them covering the sclera which is called bulbar conjunctiva and the other lining the eyelids whether the upper eyelid and lower eyelid which is called palpebral conjunctiva here it is uh, uh, denoted as tarsal conjunctiva and the two conjunctiva are reflecting above and below to continue with each other the space at the reflection between the bulbar and uh, palpebral conjunctiva is called the fornix and therefore we have a superior fornix and inferior fornix at the reflections of these conjunctiva. Uh, this is a figure show you the inferior fornix when you are retracting or everting the lower eyelid. It is a line of reflection of the bulbar conjunctiva to the conjunctival, uh, to the palpebral conjunctiva. And uh, if the eye fissure or the palpebral fissure is closed when the upper eyelid comes in contact with the lower eyelid, the conjunctiva therefore will form a sac, a complete sac, which is called conjunctival sac. Regarding the structure of the eyelid, the upper eyelid is uh, larger and more movable than the lower eyelid. And each of the upper and lower eyelid are formed of the following structures from superficial to deep. The most superficial is the skin, of course, and uh, deep to the skin is the superficial fascia, 
uh, that contains orbicularis oculi muscle. Orbicularis oculi muscle actually is described to be formed of two parts. The part which is inside the eyelid is called the palpebral part of orbicularis oculi that is responsible for closing the, uh, the uh, eyelid slightly or lightly, just like in blinking. The other part of orbicularis oculi, which is the part attached to the margins of the orbit, that is called orbital part of orbicularis oculi, which is responsible for closing the, uh, the eye or closing the palpebral fissure forcefully. Deep to the uh, orbicularis oculi muscle, we can see a plate of fibrous tissue, which is called tarsus or tarsal plates. And so we have a superior tarsal plate in the upper eyelid and inferior tarsal plate in the lower eyelid. The superior tarsal plate is more rigid than the inferior tarsal plate and it is very difficult to be reflected just like we had done here in the lower eyelid because the superior tarsus plate is more rigid and it is difficult to be reflected for a clinical examination. The junction of the upper and lower tarsal plates, medially and laterally, is connected to what's called palpebral ligament to the margins of the orbit. And therefore, we have a medial palpebral ligament extending from the upper and lower tarsus plates to the medial orbital margin and a lateral palpebral ligament extending from the upper and lower tarsal plates to the lateral orbital margin. Inside the tarsal plates, of course, this is the tarsal plates, the violet color. Inside it are many sebaceous glands secreting uh, sebaceous secretion, oily secretion. These glands are called meibomian me, uh, glands and they are having a duct that opens at the margins of the eyelids and deep to the tarsal plates where the meibomian glands are embedded is the last layer of the eyelid which is the palpebral conjunctiva. The medial angle and lateral angle uh, at the junction of the upper lids and the lower lid are called the angles of the eye or called canthus of the eye, medial angle of the eye or called medial canthus and lateral angle of the eye or lateral canthus. You can see that the eyelashes form two to three layers of hair that project from the margins of the uh, eyelids. Now we will consider the lacrimal apparatus that produce the tear. Actually, at the medial end of the eyelashes, whether the upper eyelashes or the lower eyelashes, at the medial end of them is an elevation which is called lacrimal papilla. The apex of this lacrimal papilla contains an opening which is called lacrimal punctum. Tears enter into the uh, lacrimal punctum, whether the upper lacrimal punctum or the lower lacrimal punctum, when we are moving the eyelids during the blinking. And the tear passing through the upper punctum or the lower punctum, which are at the apex of the lacrimal papillae, pass through the lacrimal canaliculi that is connected with each punctum. Actually, there is a triangular red region at the medial angle of the eye. This triangular red region is called lacus lacrimali or lacrimal lake because tears are accumulated here and from there it passes into the punctum. This red triangular region, the lacrimal lake, contain an elevation inside it which is called lacrimal caruncles. 
the tears that pass through the upper lacrimal canaliculi or the lower lacrimal canaliculi after passing through the opening of the puncta then the tears reach the lacrimal sac which lies in the medial wall of the orbit that is in between the anterior and posterior lacrimal crest and the lacrimal sac is connected below with the lacrimal duct which is sometimes referred to as the nasolacrimal duct because this duct connecting the lacrimal sac inferiorly with the nasal cavity to be opened into the inferior concha of the nasal cavity uh, below the inferior concha of the nasal cavity in the space which is called inferior meatus the nasolacrimal duct is opened into the inferior meatus which is the space below the inferior concha actually the lacrimal sac is squeezed by contraction of orbicularis oculi resulting in compression of the tears inside the lacrimal sac down into the nasal cavity the lacrimal fluid is produced by the lacrimal gland this gland is almond in shape as you can see it lies in the superior lateral part of the orbit inside uh, fossa which is called lacrimal fossa lying in the uh, lateral part or anterior lateral part of the roof of the orbit this lacrimal gland contains many ducts that secretes tears into the upper fornix of the conjunctiva and the tears will pass from the upper fornix nutritioning and uh, the eye uh, the eye preventing it from dryness and nutritioning the eye and then the tear will be collected in the leg of lacrimal lac and then from that it will be pushed into the punctum and then into the canaliculi reaching the sac and contraction of orbicularis oculi will push the tears from the lacrimal sac into the, laso, into the nasolacrimal duct into the uh, inferior meatus below the inferior concave of the nasal cavity. Regarding nerve supply to the lacrimal gland, we have discussed the nerve supply of the lacrimal gland. It is from the trigopalatine ganglia. We said that the, uh, in the middle there is a superior and inferior salivatory nuclei. The axons of the neurons in these nuclei pass with the facial nerve and then the axons of the inferior and superior salivatory nuclei leave the facial nerve with the greater petrosal branch of facial nerve. And the greater petrosal nerve, uh, the axons in the greater petrosal nerve, uh, branch of facial nerve, is connected with the neurons in the trigopalatine ganglia. And uh, then after, the, uh, new, the axons of neurons in the trigopalatine ganglia will supply the mucosal glands in the palate naso uh, pharynx, nasal cavity, and lacrimal gland. But uh, here we must add uh, three specific details. The first detail is that uh, the greater petrosal nerve, a branch from facial nerve, not directly pass to the uh, pterygopalatine ganglia. The greater petrosal nerve pass uh, in the pterygoid canal that is uh, inside the bone uh, which is called pterygoid process you remember that the medial and lateral pterygoid plates on the base of the skull uh, their union is called pterygoid process and the greater petrosal nerve pass through the pterygoid process through the bone of pterygoid process in a canal called pterygoid canal and thus it will be called uh, as nerve of pterygoid canal or sometimes it is called median nerve and this is the nerve that is connected with pterygopalatine ganglia, with the neurons in the pterygopalatine ganglia. This is the first uh, specific details that uh, we want to add now. Also, another detail. Uh, we said that neurons in the pterygopalatine ganglia, their axons pass with the maxillary nerve to supply the lacrimal gland. And we want to add some details here also. The axons of neurons in the pterygopalatine ganglia first pass with the maxillary nerve 
and then it will pass with the zygomatic branch of maxillary nerve and then these axons of neurons in the trigopalatine ganglia will leave the zygomatic branch of mandibular nerve to run with the lacrimal branch of ophthalmic nerve inside the orbit to reach the lacrimal gland. The third detail that I want to add uh, now is that the trigopalatine ganglia not only receives parasympathetic secretomotor fibers or nerve supply from the superior and inferior salivatory nuclei and thus the trigopalatine ganglia provides parasympathetic secretomotor fiber to the lacrimal gland. The pterygopalatine ganglia also has uh, sympathetic nerve supply from the superior cervical sympathetic ganglia. Sp uh, sympathetic nerve fibers uh, from the superior sympathetic cervical ganglia first run with the internal carotid artery and then uh, leave the internal carotid artery forming the so-called deep petrosal nerve that uh, runs in the inside the bone of petrous temporal bone. This deep petrosal nerve reaches the pterygopalatine ganglia and without connecting, it is only reaching the pterygopalatine ganglia, it passes the through ganglia to supply the lacrimal gland also with sympathetic fiber. But the difference is that the sympathetic fiber will not be connected with the neurons of the pterygopalatine ganglia. They will all only pass it through the ganglia and perforating it and then passing with the maxillary nerve and having the same course to reach the lacrimal gland providing sympathetic innervation from uh, uh, the deep petrosal nerve which is a branch from uh, the plexus around the internal carotid artery. Now we will describe the structure of the eyeball. The eyeball is formed by the following structures from outside to inside. First. We have the first layer, which is the most superficial layer, is a fibrous layer, this form of fibrous tissue. This layer represented posteriorly in most of the parts of the eyeball by the white sclera. But the fibrous layer, the, the most outer layer, anteriorly shows the transparent cornea. So anteriorly the transparent cornea and uh, the white sclera, which covers most of the eyeball, represent the uh, outer layer of the eyeball, the fibrous outer layer. Deep to the cornea and sclera, which are the fibrous layer, is a vascular layer. And actually, the vascular layer is called the choroid layer. It is formed anteriorly by the, color, by the colored iris, and more posteriorly by the ciliary body. And in most of its posterior part, it's showing the layer which is called the choroid layer. So the second layer or the middle layer, which is the vascular layer, is formed mostly by the choroid that is to the inside of the sclera, but anteriorly the uh, vascular layer, the middle layer, is formed by the ciliary process also, and more anteriorly by the iris, the color iris, that's surrounding the opening of the pupil of the eye. Actually, the ciliary body is a vascular layer and also contain muscles, which are called ciliaris muscle. The ciliary body uh, shows the processes that are attached to a ligament to the lens of the eye. The ciliary body is connected to the lens of the eye by a suspensory ligament, which are called also zonular fibers. This zonular fiber extends from the periphery of the lens of the eye to the processes of the ciliary body. And contraction of the ciliary muscles uh, inside the ciliary body helps in accommodation of the shape of the lens for uh, near vision. So, first we have fibrous layer, which is cornea and sclera. Second, we have vascular uveal layer, which is iris, ciliary body, and choroid. More to the inside, we will see the third layer, which is the light sensitive layer, that is the retina. Actually, the retina is not, not of all of it is considered as uh, uh, light sensitive. Uh, it is formed of the three parts, there are three parts in the retina, and we will describe that soon. But before describing the retina, I want to add that if you look to the right and left orbital walls, you can see that the medial orbital walls are uh, parallel to each other on the right and left side. 
Why the lateral orbital walls on the right and left side are on right angle to each other? And you can see that also the axis of the eyeball, not following the axis of the orbit, the axis of the eyeball is directed forward. Therefore, the axis of the eyeball is parallel to the medial walls of the orbit. And now I will describe the retina. As I said, the retina is formed of three parts, from anterior to posterior. The retina, or the inner layer, that lines the posterior aspect of the iris is called iridal part of the retina. And the retina that covers the surface of the ciliary body is called the ciliary part of the retina. Both these parts are non-visual part. They are not sensitive to light. But the most posterior part that lines the choroid and line the sclera is the optic part of the retina, which is the visual part of retina containing uh, rod and cone photoreceptor cells. The space between the cornea and the iris is called anterior chamber. The anterior chamber is limited anteriorly by the cornea, posteriorly by the iris. And the space behind the iris, between the iris anteriorly, the lens and ciliary body posteriorly, is called the posterior chamber. Both these chambers are connected with each other by uh, or via the uh, pupil of the eye. And both these chambers, the anterior chamber and posterior chamber, are filled with a fluid which is called aqueous humor. This fluid, the aqueous humor, is secreted from the ciliary processes of ciliary body and is drained by the canal of Schlem that is lying at the corneocicleral junction, which has been described previously. The corneocicleral junction is called the limbus. Here, the corneocicleral junction, the limbus, contain a canal of Schlem that drains the aqueous humor, which is produced by the ciliary processes of ciliary body. The space behind the lens of the eye and behind the ciliary process is filled with a vitreous humor. There is a region which is called the macula in the sensitive uh, part, the third part of the retina. The macula is uh, a red region that is lying in the posterior pole of the eyeball. It could be seen during ophthalmoscopic or slit lap examination. You can look to the eye through the pupil using a special instrument called ophthalmoscope or another instrument called the slit lamp. And if you look to the uh, eye through the pupil, you will look to the retina at the posterior pole of the eyeball and you will see a yellow pigmented region at the posterior pole of the sensitive part of the retina. The center of this uh, yellow pigmented macula is a depression or a pit which is called fovea centralis. The fovea centralis contains mainly uh, cone photoreceptor cells. It does not contain rod photoreceptor cells. Or the retina contain rod and cones photoreceptors, but the fovea centralis, the pit in the macula, contains only cone photoreceptor. And therefore, this pit, the fovea centralis, is responsible for sharp daily vision and colored vision, because the cones uh, are responsible for colored and uh, sharp vision. Medial or nasal to the macula is a region of entry of the optic nerve into the eyeball. This region is called the blind spot or called optic disc. It could be seen as a pale pink or orange disc, medial or nasal uh, to the uh, fovea centralis by a few millimeters. Uh, here, the optic disc, the entry of the optic nerve, has no rod and no cones photoreceptor. And therefore, it is a blind region. No vision occurs here, no visual, uh, visual sensitivity. The second part of this uh, topic will be muscles of the orbit, which are called extraocular muscles. Extraocular muscles are seven muscles, 
Four of them are called recti muscle because they are running backward from the sclera in a rectus position, straight position. We have superior rectus, inferior rectus, lateral rectus, and medial rectus. The four recti muscles are originating from a ring of fibrous tissue attached to the apex of the orbit posteriorly. This ring is called annulus of Zinn. While the insertion of these four recti muscles, superior, inferior, lateral, and medial, is into the sclera, just anterior to the equator of the eyeball, or at the equator of the eyeball. Uh, the fibrous ring giving origin to the four recti muscles is attached to the bony margins of the optic canal and bony margins of the medial part of the superior orbital fissure, as you can see in this figure. In addition to the four recti muscle, we have two oblique muscles, which, which are inferior oblique and superior oblique. You can see that uh, the superior oblique originating from the uh, bone of, of the roof of the orbit above the uh, fibrous ring of the recti, and then the superior oblique is turned around a trochlea made of fibrous tissue or fibrocartilaginous tissue, and then after the trochlea, the tendon of superior oblique turns laterally to be attached to the sclera. You can see that the tro trochlea of the superior oblique is attached to the medial wall of the orbit, while the inferior oblique is originating from the floor of the orbit and is attached to the sclera. The insertion of superior oblique and inferior oblique uh, to the sclera is on the posterior lateral aspect of the sclera. The seventh muscle, which is the last muscle, which is levator palpebri superioris, this muscle originates from the lesser wing of a sphenoid at the uh, back of the roof of orbit, but levator palpebri superioris is inserted into the superior tarsal plate of the upper eyelid, and so it is responsible for opening of the eyelid, of the upper eyelid, the function that is uh, in opposition to the uh, closure of the eye by uh, orbicularis oculi, levator palpebri superioris, attached to the superior tarsal plate of the upper eyelid, and thus its contraction opens the eyelid, opens the upper eyelid. Regarding the movement of the eye, of uh, the extraocular muscles, or function of the extraocular muscles, I think that these three figures will help you very much. For example, you know, the eye, both right and left, uh, will move in conjugate pattern. For example, if you deviate the left eye to the lateral side, the lateral deviation of the uh, left eye to the lateral side is produced by a lateral rectus muscle. And this lateral deviation of the left eye is accompanied by medial deviation of the right eye produced by medial rectus muscle. Similarly, you can see in this figure that the superior lateral movement of the eye is a function of superior rectus muscle, while the superior medial function of the left eye is produced by the inferior oblique muscle. So, for example, if you deviate the left eye superior medially by inferior oblique, this function will be accompanied by superior lateral deviation of the right eye by superior rectus, uh, and so on. Uh, this figure is not only showing you the uh, muscles move producing the movement, but also the nerve that supply the muscle producing the movement. For example, here, superior rectus is supplied by the third cranial nerve. Lateral rectus is supplied by the abducent nerve, the sixth cranial nerve. Inferior oblique is supplied by the trochlear nerve, because in the exam, you will be asked that if a uh, lateral, if the abducent nerve, the sixth cranial nerve on the right side is damaged, what is the function that will be lost? You will say that the right uh, sixth cranial nerve, the abducent nerve, supply lateral rectus, and therefore lateral deviation of the right eye will be lost, resulting in double vision. Uh, you will see this one structure uh, two when you look uh, laterally, and in addition to diplopia, al hawal. Therefore, uh, you have to study this uh, figure meticulously with that and that figure. You can see that the upward movement, for example, is a function of both superior rectus and inferior oblique, but upward and lateral is a function of superior rectus. Upward and medial is a function of inferior oblique. So you better study these figures meticulously. Regarding the nerve supply, which is shown in the figure, uh, all the extraocular muscles, include levator palpebris superioris, are supplied by the oculomotor nerve, which is the third cranial nerve, except LR6 and SO4. What is LR6, SO4? LR6, that lateral rectus supplied by the sixth cranial nerve, the abducent nerve, 
and the superior oblique muscle is supplied by the fourth cranial nerve, which is the trochlear nerve. So all extraocular muscles, including levator palpebri superioris, supplied by the oculomotor nerve, the third cranial nerve, except LR6 and SO4. In addition, some fibers of levator palpebri superioris are also supplied by sympathetic fibers, sympathetic nerve fibers. What makes the eyeball stable inside the orbit? The eyeball is made uh, uh, stable in a, very in a vertical uh, direction, the vertical stability, by a fibrous capsule attached to the sclera, which is called tenon capsule or called bulbar fascia. This fibrous capsule extends from the optic nerve posteriorly to the corneocicleral junction anteriorly. The corneocicleral junction is called the lumbus. So the tenon capsule or the bulbar fascia helping in vertical stability of the eyeball in the orbit is a fibrous tissue membrane or a facial membrane around the sclera, above the sclera, extending from the optic nerve posteriorly to the corneocicleral junction anteriorly. This tenon capsule go also gives extension around all extraocular muscles, tubular extension or prolongation around all the extraocular muscles, as you can see. This is the lateral rectus and it's surrounded by tubular extension. And from this tubular extension, there will be thickening uh, from the tubular extension of lateral rectus and medial rectus. These thickening are called check ligaments. So you have lateral check ligament from tubular extension of bulbar fascia around lateral rectus to the zygomatic bone at the lateral wall. And you will have medial check ligament from tubular extension of the bulbar fascia on medial rectus to the medial wall of the orbit, which is the lacrimal bone. Actually, these check ligaments also helping in stability of the uh, eyeball. In addition to the medial check ligament and lateral check ligament, you can see that the medial check ligament extending from tubular sheath around medial rectus and lateral check ligament extending from tubular sheath of uh, prolongation around lateral rectus. Between the tubular sheath of medial rectus and lateral rectus, there is another ligament below the eye which is called suspensory, suspensory ligament of locus. This ligament, the suspensory ligaments, uh, holds the eye from below and preventing the eye from resting on the floor of the orbit. This suspensory ligament contains the inferior rectus muscle and inferior oblique muscle. Regarding the anterior posterior stability, not the vertical stability, actually the fat is, the orbit is filled with fat and it's, uh, this fat is uh, responsible for anterior posterior stability of the eyeball into orbit. Also, the uh, forward pull of the oblique muscle, superior and inferior oblique muscle, and the pull of recti muscle with the check ligaments helps in anterior posterior stability of the eyeball. There are some nerves in the orbit. One of them is the optic nerve. The optic nerve is formed by ganglionic cells in the retina. Axons of ganglionic cells of the retina exit from the eyeball, uh, just medial to the posterior pole, forming the optic nerve. The optic nerve directed backward and medially to enter the optic canal at the apex of the orbit, reaching the middle cranial fossae, where it connects with the optic nerve on the other side, forming the optic chiasma. The optic nerve is surrounded by dural meninges, and it contains central retinal blood vessels. The other nerve in the orbit is the oculomotor nerve, which is the third cranial nerve. Actually, the third cranial nerve runs in the uh, cavernous sinus, in the lateral wall of cavernous sinus, and in the cavernous sinus, the third cranial nerve gives upper division and lower division. Both these upper and lower divisions enter the orbit through superior orbital fissure and supply all the extraocular muscles except LR6 and SO4, and the oculomotor nerve is uh, connected with the ciliary ganglia, one of the four parasympathetic ganglia of the head and neck. This ciliary ganglia uh, receives uh, parasympathetic innervation from the oculomotor nerve and also receives sympathetic innervation. This ciliary ganglia gives ciliary branches entering into the sclera, into the inside of the eyeball, and the sympathetic and parasympathetic branches of the ciliary ganglia supply the sphincteric muscle of the iris producing constriction of the iris and also these ciliary nerves uh, entering the eyeball to supply the ciliaris muscles in the ciliary body.
Other nerves of the orbit are the abducens nerve, which is the sixth cranial nerve, and the trochlear nerve, which is the fourth cranial nerve. Both re these nerves run in the cavernous sinus and enter the orbit into the superior orbital fissure. But the abducens nerve supply SO4, which uh, the abducens supply the LR6, which is lateral rectus, as you can see, and the uh, trochlear nerve supply the SO4, the superior oblique muscle. Finally, we have branches of the ophthalmic nerve, which is a branch from the trigeminal nerve. Actually, we have three branches in the orbit from the ophthalmic nerve, a branch of the trigeminal nerve, which are frontal nerve, lacrimal nerve, and nasociliary nerve. The lacrimal nerve is a very thin nerve running at the upper border of lateral rectus muscle to supply the uh, lacrimal gland. This lacrimal nerve, as we said before, is connected with the zygomatic nerve. The zygomatic nerve is a branch of the maxillary nerve, which is containing uh, sympathetic and parasympathetic fibers from the pterygopalatine ganglia. So the lacrimal nerve is one of the branches of the uh, ophthalmic nerve run at the upper border of lateral rectus to supply the lacrimal gland with sympathetic and parasympathetic fiber. The other branch of the ophthalmic is the frontal nerve. Actually, the frontal nerve is a very thick nerve. You can see it once you remove the roof of the orbit, as you can see in this figure, the roof of the orbit is removed. And once you remove the roof of the orbit, you will see the frontal nerve lying uh, or running forward on levator palpebri superioris. If you remove the roof of the orbit, you will directly see the frontal nerve running forward on the uh, levator palpebri superioris. Anteriorly, the frontal nerve will be divided into supratrochlear and supraorbital branches that supply the forehead of the face and the skull. The last nerve, which is uh, from the ophthalmic branch of the trigeminal, is the nasociliary nerve. This nerve also uh, enters the orbit through the superior orbital fissure, but as it enters the orbit, it will cross above the optic nerve with the ophthalmic artery from lateral to medial and giving many branches, uh, as you can see in the figure. Actually, all the three branches of the ophthalmic nerve, the frontal, lacrimal, and nasociliary nerves, enter the orbit through the superior orbital fissure, not only the nasociliary nerve. Regarding the blood supply to the orbit, the blood supply to the orbit is by the ophthalmic artery branch of the internal carotid artery. This ophthalmic branch of the internal carotid artery enters the orbit through the optic canal with the uh, optic nerve. And then, as we said before a while, the ophthalmic artery crosses above the optic nerve from lateral to medial with the nasociliary nerve and giving many, many branches that are named uh, in, in this figure and you can uh, study it on the figure. The ophthalmic artery is accompanied by a superior and inferior ophthalmic vein. Regarding clinical anatomy, if there is a damage to the cervical sympathetic chain, you will have a condition which is called Horner syndrome. Horner syndrome occurs or uh, resulting in constriction of the pupil, which is called meiosis, dropping, mild dropping of the eyelid, which is called the ptosis, no sweating on the sa same side affected, that is called anhydrosis, and feeling of hotness in the left side of the face because of vasodilatation. All of these are functions of the sympathetic nerves and therefore damage to the cervical sympathetic trunk will result in these features. Uh, constriction of the pupil is uh, uh, lost because uh, there will be a constriction by the constrict sphincter constrictor, constrictor uh, muscles of the eyeball because the dilator muscle of the iris is paralyzed. The dilator muscle is supplied by uh, sympathetic uh, fibers. And when sympathetic fiber is damaged, constriction occur by the sphincteric muscles of the iris. The iris contains sphincteric muscles and dilator muscles. So the dilator muscles supplied by the sympathetic nerves, if it is damaged, the pupil will be constricted, narrow, uh, producing meiosis because of the unopposed function of the sphincter uh, uh, muscle of the iris. The ptosis, which is dropping of the uh, eyelid slightly, because part of levator palpebris superioris is supplied by sympathetic nerves, as we said before a while. And because the sympathetic nerve is damaged, partial dropping of the eyelid due to, function, due to loss of function of part of levator palpebris superioris. Similarly, anhydrosis and vasodilatation. Another clinical condition, we said with the anterior chamber and posterior chamber of the eye, we have here at the cornea sclera junction, 
a canal of slim, the uh, vitreous, the uh, aqueous humor filling the anterior chamber and posterior chamber of the eye in front of the lens is produced by processes of the ciliary body. And the uh, aqueous humor produced by the processes of ciliary body pass to the posterior chamber between the iris and the lens. And then the aqueous humor produced by the ciliary body pass through the pupil of the eye to the anterior chamber between the cornea and the iris. And then the aqueous humor here pass to the canal of Schlem at the of Schlem at the cornea sicnella junction to drain to the venous circulation. If the canal of Schlem at the cornea sicnella junction is obstructed, the pressure of the aqueous humor will be produced because there will be pr production of aqueous humor, but no drainage of aqueous humor because the canal of Schlem is obstructed. So high pressure will be produced in the anterior and posterior chamber. This high pressure will press on the vitreous humor and the pressure, high pressure in the vitreous humor will press on the optic nerve and thus the optic nerve will be damaged due to this pressure. That's all about the subject. Thank you very much.